it's great to be with you this morning. I, I really enjoyed our time Friday, uh, the movie, meeting so many of you, hearing stories about my father and the impact he had on your life. Um, I don't know if you have a favorite um, quote in the movie, but one of my favorite quotes is when my father says in the movie, God said, all I needed is some good raw material. <laughs> and I was good raw material. I like it because it shows how my dad thought about himself. He didn't see himself as really anything special. Um, and yet, <laughs> he had such a great impact on so many people. Do you realize that? So some people ask me, well, what is it about your dad that allowed him to have such a great impact? Now, you may be surprised to hear the answer. It wasn't just the quality of what he taught. It was also how he lived his life. Um, he was always trying to help others. Did you know that about him? He never really thought about himself. You know, in a lot of ways, what allowed him to have a great impact was because he lived his life first and foremost as a servant of Christ. He was a great role model for me, and I'm trying to live my life to pattern off of the way he lived his life. You know, how my dad lived his life in a lot of ways reminds me about the Apostle Paul. Do you ever think about that? The Apostle Paul in the New Testament? In fact, my dad's favorite verse is Philippians 1.21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So what was it about the Apostle Paul's life that made how he lived so fruitful and impactful? I think this is especially something that we should be concerned about especially those of us who want to be servants of Christ. And so last month, what I did is I just took some time. I read through a good part of the New Testament trying to answer that question about the Apostle Paul's life. What was it? And what I'd like to do this morning is just share with you a picture, a portrait of the Apostle Paul's life. And, but I'd like to do more than that. Specifically, I'd like to share with you what I discovered, that there are five keys to living a fruitful and impactful life as a servant, lever, uh, servant of Christ as we look at the Apostle Paul's life. So, like I said, in doing this, I wanna just paint a portrait for you so you can see what a servant leader of Christ should look like. Now, the first key to be fruitful and impactful comes when you and I recognize that our strength comes from when we turn away from our own personal resources to accomplish God's purposes. Have you learned that lesson yet? We can't rely on ourselves to do what God wants us to do to have the impact we're going to have. To be honest, I feel like I'm just learning that. I'm just beginning to understand that. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying that the Apostle Paul wasn't capable of doing a lot of things. In fact, we know from Acts 14.1 it was referring to the Apostle Paul, that they came to Iconium. And what happened? Well, they spoke in such a way that many believe. That means that Paul was persuasive in sharing the good news. All right? But you see snapshots over and over in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul made it clear that he didn't rely on his own strength. He relied on God to accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish. Now, there are many places we can see this in the New Testament, but there's one place in particular that's very clear. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Let's start with verse 1. Let me read this for you, and then let's talk about this. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Do you hear what Paul was saying here? Paul wasn't trying to speak in a way to say, oh, wow, Paul, um, you're so wise, or wow, Paul, you're so eloquent. That wasn't Paul's goal. He didn't speak so that people would think that about the apostle Paul. He says in verse 2 why he did this. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, the first thing I want to know when I read verse 2 is this. What does it mean, Paul, that you want to know Jesus Christ and him crucified and that's it? Well, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Paul only spoke about Jesus Christ and didn't even talk about the God of the Old Testament. In fact, do you remember in 1 Corinthians 9.22 what Paul says to the Corinthians? He said, I became what? All things to all men so that by all means I can save some. So when he was speaking to a Jewish person, he would build bridges from their perspective and talk about the promised Messiah. But then in Acts 17, did you notice when Paul's speaking to the humanists and the pantheists of his day? He talked about the nature of God. So Paul just didn't speak about Jesus only. So what is Paul trying to say in verse 2? Well, let's look back to 1 Corinthians 1.17 because I think it gives us some insight into understanding what Paul was trying to communicate to us. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and listen, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Did you hear that? Paul didn't depend on his persuasive words because it wasn't the words he chose that made a difference. It was the power of God. And specifically, it was that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's the power of the cross that changes everything. Doesn't it? Let me illustrate this principle from my own life. You know, there are times that I'm trying to witness to an atheist, <laughs> and I can't get them to see that there's good evidence for the Christian faith. Do you know what I do sometimes? I'll change my approach, and I'll ask them something like this. I'm just curious. Have you come to any conclusions about Jesus Christ? You know, that simple question sometimes can change the whole nature of the conversation. Why? Well, there's something about the name Jesus. And there's something specifically about his sacrificial and miraculous life that's hard to ignore. Now, to make the point even more clear, look what he says in verses 4 and 5. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power, so that your faith may not rest in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Isn't that clear now? It's not Paul's words that he relied on. It was the power of God. And we know that the Holy Spirit is the one that impacts people's hearts in order to produce the changes that need to happen. It's that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Remember what Paul said in Romans 8, 11? Listen to what he says and think about the implications for our own life. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. 
So when we invite Christ to come into our life, he can change us. And it's that same power that raised Jesus from the dead that's available to us to live a transformed life. You know, when I'm witnessing to a non-believer, I always remind them there are two decisions you need to make about Jesus. First, you need to decide, is there enough evidence to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? But then you have to make a, a more important decision. Do you want to believe in Christ? And believing in Christ has nothing to do with the evidence, has to do with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to believe in Jesus. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to help us, to help others, to embrace Jesus. And only the Holy Spirit can change people's hearts. And that's why we see Paul boast in his weakness. He realized it wasn't his strength that made a difference in his ministry. It was the power of God. Look at what he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. But he, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can I suggest to you that that is the secret that Paul learned about the Christian life? that we too need to learn. The secret is not to rely on our own strength, but on God alone. This is the first key to living a fruitful and impactful life. The second key is this. When we choose to tap into God's unlimited source of power to fuel our lives, have you learned that lesson yet? Have you learned that you're only going to be able to live the Christian life if you tap into God's power and not your own? It's a choice, isn't it? I can choose to live the Christian life in my own strength and fail miserably. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you that. Or I can choose to live the way God wants me to live and tap into his power. Now, the Apostle Paul understood how important it was to live the Christian life by tapping into God's power. You know, one of my favorite verses is Philippians 2.13. Do you know that verse? You know why that's so helpful for me? Because it reminds me of the changes that God has got to do in me. He's got to give me the desire, and then he's got to give me the power to accomplish anything he wants me to do. The same thing is true in your life. God has to change you and give you the desire and then the ability to carry it out. Listen to what Philippians 2.13 says. For it is God who is at work in you, both the will and work for his good pleasure. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's our source of power? J.B. Phillips wrote a book a number of years ago called Your God is Too Small. Do you remember that book? And unfortunately, many times we don't realize how true this is. We underestimate God's power. Let me illustrate this. Sometimes I'll have a conversation with an atheist, and sometimes I have to remind them that their arguments against a Christian God are not as strong as they think because they don't understand the kind of power that our God has. Do you realize that? You know, Paul understood this. 
Do you remember what Paul said in Colossians 1:17? Listen to these words. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and here's the important part, and in him all things hold together. Do you realize that if God was not holding you and I into existence at this very moment, you and I wouldn't exist? You see, we need not only a beginning cause for our existence, we need a current or sustaining cause for our existence. You know what that means? That means we're totally dependent on God for everything, for all eternity. So when Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing, that's literally true. You know how I read that? Apart from me, you can do some things. I don't realize sometimes I can do nothing apart from him. Now, the Apostle Paul understood this. He understood that he was not only completely dependent on God, but he knew something else that was very, very important. He knew well the implications of God's unlimited power being unleashed in his own life. And that's why he didn't choose to tap into his own limited resources, but rather he relied on God's unlimited resources. So here's a perspective I want you to consider in light of what we just are talking about. You and I won't have so much self-focus in our lives when our real strength comes from relying on God's unlimited resources. Is that a true statement? We won't have so much self-focus when we realize where our source of power and strength comes from. Remember what Paul said in Romans 5, 18? He said, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. That was his secret. That was the secret to the power in Paul's life. Can I suggest that's the secret to the power in your life as well? Do you know my dad was like that? He never really wanted to speak of his individual accomplishments. He always gave credit to God for everything, everything good that happened in his life. I never saw him, his whole life, I never saw him talk about his individual accomplishments, and he was such a great role model for me. So here's an important question I want us to think about. What would happen in your life and my life if we only tapped into just a drop of God's unlimited power to fuel our lives? I know my life would be different. Would yours? Would yours be different? You and I need to remember that if God has this unlimited power, what can't he do in your life and in my life? That's the second key. The third key is when we're careful to live a disciplined life so that our character is aligned with our commitment to Christ. Isn't that important? You know, my dad throughout his whole life, was never accused of doing anything immoral because of how he lived his life. He had such a disciplined life. And that really was an example to me. Now, if you look in the New Testament, you see over and over again, Paul had that same approach. He saw the importance of our life matching our beliefs. He understood that the greatest aid to keep us from making bad decisions in our life is when we walk in dependency on the Holy Spirit moment by moment. Do you remember what Paul said 
in Galatians 5.16 about the Holy Spirit. He said, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, when Paul says walk by the Spirit, he's saying walk by means of the Spirit, just like you would have crutches if you had a broken leg. You would walk by means of those crutches. You see, Paul understood how important it was for our faith to be genuine. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 11.3. But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. A sincere devotion to Christ. That's what the world is looking for. Authentic Christians. Paul also knew that the enemy was constantly looking for ways to trip up Christians. Do you know that? Do you understand that in your own life? Look at what happened in our culture in the last 60 years. Look at what's happened. Look at all the destruction from the enemy. My father pointed out in the movie that from 1960 to 1990, we removed from, um, from our public schools the teaching of creation, creator, and God-given moral values. And look at what's happened since then. Look at all the immorality we allow on our airwaves. The bottom line is this. If you and I ever hope to reach those in our circle of influence today, our, 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 we have to be sincere in our faith. Paul also reminds us that we need to be aware of the attacks of the enemy because of all the destruction the enemy can cause in our life. Look at what the enemy has done to destroy marriages in the, in, in the United States. Really, all the destruction. Paul reminds Timothy and, and, uh, or Titus in Titus 2.12, be sober-minded, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, I have to remind myself of that truth almost every day. Because I don't know about you, but I am facing more and more spiritual warfare every day. It seems to me we all need to pray for spiritual protection from the enemy. Our character needs to be aligned with our commitment. That's the third key. The fourth key is this. When we live our life tethered by the convictions about our calling. Do you believe that? Paul was a man driven by his convictions about his calling. Look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul had such a deep conviction about what God wanted him to do that he felt that he had no right to boast in being obedient because it was his irrevocable obligation. How about you? Do you feel this obligation to do what God has called you to do, whatever that is? You see, for the Apostle Paul, it was more than an obligation. It was a deep, abiding conviction. Remember the difference between an opinion and a conviction? An opinion is something you hold, and a conviction is something that holds you. And Paul had a deep, abiding conviction about his calling. But please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. It's not just that the Apostle Paul has a calling. It's not just that the pastors in this church have a calling. The teachers of this church have a calling. 
all of us have a calling. Amen? All of us have a calling in the body of Christ. No matter what role we play in the body of Christ. Listen to where Paul makes this clear in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ. Notice here, the focus is on to equip the saints so they can do the work of the ministry. That means all of us in the church have a calling. All of us play a part. Pastors, teachers, leaders, they have a responsibility to equip you so that you can do the work of the ministry. Do you believe that? Each part of the body plays an irreplaceable part in God's divine plan. Do you believe that? Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 14 and 15, of the importance of the body all working together. I love this verse. It's kind of funny in a way. Listen to what Paul says. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. It's silly to think that way, right? The body has to function the way God wants it to function so that we can all exercise the gifts that God has given us so that we can do the work of the ministry. What is God calling you to do in this church, in your circle of influence? Now, you may say, well, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I can never be like the Apostle Paul. I can never be a Norm Geisler. I, I couldn't even be a Pastor Marty Baker. That's what you're saying, right? Well, you know, I understand that. I understand the reluctancy. I feel like I've been telling God what I can't do all my life. And God is saying, David, it's time. It's time for you to do the things that I need you to do. All of us have a calling, no matter what we do, no matter what our gifts are. We all have an important part to play in the body of Christ. Just think of a couple things. All of us are called to do the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4, 5. All of us are called to disciple our children and our grandchildren. All of us, all of you have a part to play. I tell my friend Charlie, who's a Vietnam War veteran, Charlie, you're going to be able to reach people I'm never going to be able to reach. And the pastors in this church are never going to be able to reach the people that you can reach. Amen? Do you believe that? Did you ever notice also that Paul didn't let his personal suffering get in the way of his calling? Can I suggest we shouldn't either? Whatever we have to suffer, Whatever God wants us to do, we should do, regardless of the cost. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.10. He reminds Timothy that he endured everything for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain salvation. You see, Paul knew that someday he's going to be accountable for his life. And this knowledge didn't promote fear in Paul's heart but a desire to please his Lord. Yet Paul was also concerned about being accountable for his life. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Why? Why? 
for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. You know, someday we're all going to have a give an account for our life, including me. You see, I've been impacted by two great men in my life, my father and my friend, Reverend Edmund Chen. And someday, I'm going to be accountable for that. Can I suggest that you all get great teaching in this church every Sunday? I know Pastor Marty Baker. I know the kind of person he is. I know what he's capable of doing. And he's a great expositor of the Word of God. And every week you get this great teaching, and someday... You're going to be held accountable for that. Just like I'm accountable for what God has given me. What are you doing with that? Now, if we find that we're not taking steps of faith to follow God's calling in our life because maybe we feel unqualified, I can relate to that. But here's something I want you to consider. We can feel unqualified to do what God has called us to do, but we can still be obedient despite our feelings. To be honest, I've never felt qualified to do what God has called me to do. Never, ever. Do you feel like that? But don't let that stop you from being accountable for what God has called you to do in your circle of influence. The fifth key is this. When you and I keep our eye on the prize, knowing how much we have to gain. Do you realize how much we have to gain? Do you realize that this life is not all there is, <laughs> that there is so much more that God is going to show us in the next life. Look, listen to what Paul said in Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. Do you remember Paul had a thorn in the flesh? Do you remember why he had that thorn in the flesh? Because God showed him a part of heaven. And he was afraid he was going to boast for the rest of his life. Here, the Apostle Paul, who boasts in Christ, was going to boast in what he saw. That tells me heaven is really amazing. Do you realize that living in this post-COVID world we live in today is not how God wants us to live? Paul understood that. Paul understood that what we're going through is not what God has for us in the end. And that's why he endured all that he did. That's why in his letters, Paul talks about all these riches we have in Christ. Let me give you one example. In 1 Corinthians 1.8, Paul says this, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize that if Jesus Christ were standing here and someone were to ask God the Father, who's more righteous, Jesus Christ or us as followers of Christ? You know what God the Father would say? They are both equally righteous in my eye because we have been imputed with Christ's righteousness. Amen? Isn't that an amazing thing? I didn't understand that really well until, I hate to say it, until after I graduated from seminary. I didn't really understand it, and it didn't really take hold in my life. You see, God sees you and I as followers of Christ, blameless, blameless, unimpeachable. <laughs> when we get to heaven, we will be unimpeachable. And because of Paul's understanding about the afterlife, 
he had a certain kind of philosophy about his present life and about the things that he should value. Look at what he says in Philippians 3, 7, and 9. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see, all those things that Paul thought were important in the past, his inherited privileges, his legal rights, his religious zeal, everything else he considered as garbage or dung compared to knowing Christ. Do you and I have that perspective? You know, in the movie, Norm Geisler, Not Qualified, my dad talks about his experience in witnessing to his mom. Do you remember that on Friday? And how she threatened to beat him to death with a hot poker stick? Do you remember what my dad's response was to her? He quoted Philippians 121. He said, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The most important thing in his life was to live for Christ. And his perspective was, Mom, if you kill me, I get to be with Christ. If you let me live, I'm going to live for Christ. That was my dad's philosophy, just like the apostle Paul. What helped Paul to live the Christian life? Well, he didn't take his eyes off the prize. Have you learned that? That we can't take our eyes off the prize. Paul said to the Philippians, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Is that what you and I are doing? Do we press on for the goal, for the prize, for the call that God has placed in our life to make a difference for eternity? You know what helped my dad? The same thing. He didn't take his eyes off the price. And he was willing to sacrifice anything to accomplish what God has called him to do. So here's a perspective I want us to consider. If we see ourselves as primarily servants of Christ and understand what we have to gain in the next life, we will value eternal things more and see temporal things as not a, as important. Is that a true statement? It is, isn't it? You see, Paul understood the urgency of what God had called him to do. So here's an observation I want to make. Paul had a certain philosophy about how to live his life. He could live with a greater sense of contentment because of that, because of how he viewed life, no matter what the circumstance. Listen to what he says in Philippians 4, 11, and 12. Not that I speak of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. See, Paul learned the secret about living the Christian life. Let me try to summarize what we've been talking about this morning. What are the keys to living a 
fruitful and impactful life as a servant of Christ? Well, the five keys we just talked about. That's a lot. (laughs) That's a lot to digest, right? You'll be thinking about that all week long. But let me try to summarize it, condense it in bites that you can take home. Here's what the Apostle Paul would say to us, that you and I should live our lives with nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to hide, and everything to gain regardless of the cost. Amen? Isn't that how we should be living our lives? You see, Paul learned the secret of living the Christian life. And isn't it time for us to follow Paul's example? What is it time for you to do in your life, even if you don't feel qualified? God may be calling you to do things that you never even thought were possible. I had no idea 10 years ago that I'd be making a movie about my dad's life and using that movie to re-equip the body of Christ around the world. I'm not qualified to do that. What aren't you qualified to do that God is asking you to do? You and I need to be faithful to what God has called us to do, knowing, as the Apostle Paul confessed in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for our time this morning. I thank you, Lord, for my dear brothers and sisters in Christ at this wonderful church in this important community. And I pray, God, that you would help them to understand, Lord, what you have called each and every one of them to do, even if they don't feel qualified. Because, Lord, we live in a world that desperately needs to hear the good news. And it looks like you're coming soon from what's happening in our world. Help us, Lord, to make the most of the times that you give us with those in our circle of influence so that we can look back in eternity and see all the things, Lord, you helped us to accomplish through your power and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen.